I'm Larry Thomas, and joining me today is Larry Brumfield. It is November, Friday, November 13th. Thank you, Larry Brumfield, for being with us today and sharing your memories. It's an honor to be here, Larry. So, uh, to begin, um, I understand that you're not originally from the Carroll County area. So, uh, do you care to talk briefly about yourself and where you've been prior to living in Westminster? Well, yeah, I've had a very uh, travel, well-traveled life uh, within the boundaries of the 48 uh, states. I was born in Indiana, went to college in Indiana to Purdue University, and from there I tr uh, started my corporate career in upstate New York, and from there to Ohio, and from Ohio to Kansas, and from Kansas to Iowa, from Iowa to Texas, from Texas to Indianap back to Indianapolis, and Indianapolis to Maryland. So it was a very circuitous route, and you have to understand that all that traveling was done before the advent of uh, laptops and cell phones. And when that became a prominent means of communication in the corporate world, uh, the movement stopped also. Right. Um, you want to uh, talk about when uh, exactly did you move to the Carroll County area? Yeah, I moved to Carroll County in uh, April of 1984. Uh, purchased a home here, and I've been here uh, ever since. I retired here from my corporate job, uh, and I raised five children here, all in went to college or some kind of trade school and are out on their own and I'm the grandfather of six. Can you uh, describe Cal County at the time that you moved here in regards to neighbors, businesses, shops, schools, and things of that nature? Yeah, well, you know, uh, being a person who has lived a lot of different places in the United States, uh, I came here with kind of a different attitude maybe than some people who move here. I've, I was accustomed to living in, in well, I guess you would call it strange places or uprooting and moving a lot. And I, so I developed a kind of philosophy on that people make uh, of a new place what they want it to be and not so much the place influencing them. So I purposely chose Carroll County, not knowing actually at the time that it was the most conservative county in the state of Maryland and not knowing at the time its socio social economic uh, history within the state. I chose Carroll County basically because at that time when I did my research and moving that it had the best public schools in the state during the 80s and I think it's still rated fairly high but it had the best public schools and I was looking for the best public schools for my kid for my children so I moved here because of that uh, subsequently upon moving here uh, I was told uh, by people who already lived here that I was nuts for moving here <laughs> as a black man <laughs> like why would you do something like that I had a friend actually who went to college with me who uh, lived in Baltimore, who was from Baltimore, and uh, I was talking to him while I was in the process of moving, and he was saying, well, I know, you know, you live in this neighborhood, you live in that neighborhood, we'll get together. And when I told him ultimately that I was moving to Carroll County, uh, he said, I cannot believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're going to subject your family to this, and I can't, you know, he gave me this whole litany of reasons why I shouldn't move to Carroll County. But I have to say, ultimately, I survived and have survived over the years, uh, probably because of the per my basic personality and my attitude towards life. Um, I, I, again, I believe that you make of life what you want it to be. And I, n I haven't had any personally strong, objectionable experiences here from my family's point of view, other than what I would call the normal experiences that people have growing up and maturing in life. Um, so it, it has it, it, it. While it has not been uh, maybe the panacea that people might want it to be, it hasn't been a horror either. Okay. So uh, just to touch a little further on that, in your opinion, uh, compared to the other places that you've lived, how do you see Westminster as far as being a progressive in community and you know breaking down racial barriers and things like that? Um, I see Westminster on two levels. I see. Uh, Westminster as being a very what I would call provincial place for the ex and I, what I mean by that is the as I became more acquainted with the existing African American population people who were born here and have generations lived here generations prior have a totally different outlook than people who move here from other places 
Um, and when I say that, and I certainly don't want to sound elitist, and I certainly don't want to insult the, the, the historical black population that has lived here, but they, sometimes when you live here and you are in, in, encompassed by a social strata, a social, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, a, a existing social system, you don't see the flaws, you don't see some of the things that people might see coming in from the outside. And as a person who has blessed with some education and some privilege of moving around to different places, I don't limit myself to what I can do and where I go and what I say and those kind of things. Whereas I, I noticed right away that some of the existing population is certainly back in the 80s, kind of what I would call knew their place and kept to their place and didn't, didn't push the boundaries of their existing uh, living standard or their existing living, their existing living existence, so to speak. Um, so, um, if you don't mind, we're gonna change gears to mm -hmm. your family a little bit. Um, to start off, um, can you uh, tell me about your relationship with your wife Kathy and her family and how they received you? Well, yeah, that was a very interesting uh, um, relationship. Now, I, I have to tell you that when I came here, I was married. I was in an interracial marriage. So my three of my children are biracial. Um, and uh, the, my first marriage was a 19 to 20 year marriage. So it wasn't a you know, fly by night situation. I was divorced while I got, after I got here and I stayed single for 10 years before I met my uh, second wife. So during those 10 years, uh, I raised our children as a single father alone. Uh, it was a, a, a mutually agreed upon arrangement by me and my, uh, me and my wife or the mother of my children that the children would stay with me and she would go on to do whatever she chose to do. That was a very trying time, to be honest with you. The father, I was three daughters, uh, three beautiful daughters, by the way, uh, and, and a father who traveled. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I had to enlist, I had to immediately seek out help and, I, uh, and uh, being raised in the church, I went back to the church to seek out help. Uh, I reestablished relationships in the local African-American church and thereby sought assistance from uh, women and people in the church to help me uh, raise my children while I was away traveling and trying to earn a living. So that was a blessing. That was a blessing because I met people that I could trust. I met people that I could bring into my home while I was away that I could trust and feel comfortable while I was away. And they assisted me wonderfully in, in helping to raise my daughters. On the other hand, um, as my daughters grew older and, and, and entered the dating phase of their lives, there was some controversy. And I have to admit there was controversy on both sides of the racial ledger uh, because as you know, uh, within the African-American community, there is one of these color barriers with people's skin tone, you know, and uh, we do this to each other. And we, uh, we have to admit, you know, the things that we, flaws that we have within our own racial structure, uh, just as we, you know, at complain about people relating to us uh, from, from the Caucasian uh, race. The, um, so they got a little, they got a little heat from both sides. They got a little heat from some African American girls who didn't like it because they could go swimming and didn't have to get their hair fixed. You know, things that a dad would think about as being silly, but yet still existed. And and they got uh, uh, friction uh, and pushback from, uh, from 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 white kids too. So they were they were a little bit unique. I mean, they were called zebras and they were called all kinds of names, you know, from both sides. And so they had to they had to mature and get an, uh, comfortable with their own identity because we as a family, uh, my in-laws, my white in-laws and, my, and myself, even though my, we, I was divorced from their daughter, we still maintained a very close relationship. And we still maintained a relationship where they visited, socialized, and were loved and nurtured by both sides of the family and until this day. So our family was like that. We didn't emphasize one side over the other. We wanted them to explore all their heritage. And so they were, they, they were, they were kind of in a, in a little bit of a bind. Um, you said your kids were under a little heat, you know, from both sides. Um, what would you do as a parent when your children came home with stories like this? Well, 
You know, it wasn't so much what I did at the time. I, I believe that you uh, stoked those fires and you nurtured those behaviors as they're coming up as little children. I don't think you can wait until things like this happen. I think you have to give them confidence and give them an environment of self-esteem, uh, let them know that they are valuable human beings, let them know that God didn't make no junk and that they are who they are and they need to be feel proud of who they are, that they can look back through my ancestry and look back through their mother's ancestry, feel loved and accepted, and then they have to do some work on their own. You can't really do it for them. You have to let allow them to grow and develop and find a comfortable uh, uh, situation that they can identify with and they feel comfortable with. And, and to this day, I, they, they come from the, my children from all, from the three girls, they have different, uh, I guess, ideas of who they are, so to speak. Uh, I, my older daughter, and again, it has nothing to do with skin tone, my older daughter, who is more, skin, more like me in terms of skin tone, uh, is married to a white guy. My youngest daughter, who looks more Caucasian, is married to a black man. So, I mean, and they, and they have all different uh, ideas about socioeconomic status and race and issues and those kind of things. But, they, but they're all very comfortable in their own skin. I have to, they're all very comfortable in their own skin, and, and, and they know that they're accepted and loved by us no matter what they do and uh, what positions they take. So they, they, I would talk to them and I would listen. And I, I guess the question, getting back to your question was, I didn't try to problem solve for them. I tried to be there to listen. So I would listen. Now, if they ask me, you know, Dad, what should I do? I would interject. But most of the time, they just wanted a, a, a ear or a shoulder or somebody to just kind of vent on, vent with, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, you said that they were comfortable wearing their skin. Um, can you think of any time that your kids now or in the past have had any confusion about which race they identify with uh, socially or in, like, an application process or anything of that nature? No, they don't. They, 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 they have not shared that with me. They, they, all, they share a lot with me oh, with the fact that they are sometimes uh, misidentified because people assume things. The, my, my one daughter who lives in Texas is always identified as a Mexican-American before people actually talk to her and find out. You know, she'll, people will walk up to her and start speaking Spanish to her uh, <laughs> before they even know that she's not Spanish. Uh, the, uh, my one daughter who lives up in Hanover, Pennsylvania, my oldest daughter, she's mistaken as a Caribbean or Puerto Rican woman, uh, uh, but she doesn't get all upset about it. She just clarifies the situation and moves on. Uh, now, it's more of a class issue. I'm finding nowadays as we move forward, the, uh, these issues rate, relate more to class. Uh, when, uh, and maybe your dads or your family have identified with this. When I go out in the summertime, if I'm out mowing my lawn and I have my lawn mowing clothes on and I go to the store because I need a quick something or other, I'm treated much more differently than if I were to go to the store looking like I look today. Same thing happens with my daughters. Uh, uh, they seek medical treatment. My daughter was just relating this the other day to me. She said she sought, went to the Hanover Hospital to seek some kind of medical treatment in the emergency room, and they automatically assumed that she was an illiterate uh, Puerto Rican woman who didn't understand English and didn't understand the treatment that they were proposing to her and those kind of things. And she, you know, she has a master's degree and she's very bright, <laughs> so she understood. So uh, she had to clarify that right away. She, but she didn't do it. She, I said, how did, how did you do that? She said, I just started using language that would get them to understand that I had an education, that I wasn't an illiterate woman that didn't understand the treatment plan that they were proposing. So a lot of things are assumed, you know, that uh, by the way you dress, uh, the clothes you have on, uh, you know, the beard, the two e the earrings, those kind of things. They just assume that you're of a certain class and a certain ilk without uh, talking to you and, uh, and getting to know you, more or less. Did you see, uh, being that your children are three different ages, did you see any change over the years in the way that they were treated as, as you know, the time period changed? Oh, yeah, things, things, I, I have a, the, 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 there's an age difference between my oldest and youngest of 10 years. And, um, and my oldest graduated from Westminster High School in 88, my next, my old, my youngest in 98. And from the time, from the, and those, within those 10 years, there was a big, big difference. Um, my, 
oldest girl was a, what do you call, a flag girl on the, uh, in the marching band, and, and she had to work very, very, very hard to secure that position as one of the flag girls. She was the only person of color within that color guard, as I recall. And she had to work very, very hard to secure that position. Uh, my next girl, actually, who I have one in the middle, who ended up being more of the athlete, she ran track and that kind of thing. She, uh, by virtue of her personality, she's more like her dad. She just went in and said, you know, I'm here, deal with it. That was her kind of a personality. So she, uh, she's kind of like just bust in the room and said, you know, if uh, I, I think the coach said, I need somebody to take stats and the team plays, you know, basketball stats. There's always, she says, uh, she says, well, you know, I'm, I'll do it. And, uh, and he looked at her, uh, said, you know, you know, are you sure you can do this? And she said, oh, well, you think I can do it? You know, so she, she's the one that kind of like assumes that I can do whatever I want, choose to do. And my, my youngest daughter, who is a little bit more shy, uh, uh, she does what she wants to do, but she does it kind of uh, in a uh, in an apologetic type, type way. You know, I'm 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 capable. I can do what I want to do, but I don't want to raise any. I don't, I don't want to raise uh, uh, what's the word? I don't want to uh, raise the cackles or feathers because you don't think, you think I may not belong here, but I will show you by my actions, by my behavior, by my efforts, and uh, by my achievements that I can, that I can, I can do what I want to do. Now, I have to admit, it was interesting circumstance in, um, with my middle daughter, who was a very bright girl and had several college offers. Her and another African-American girl uh, were doing college visits. And during that time at Westminster High, their, the college guidance team would take groups to visit all the colleges in Maryland. They would take a week or a day, I'm sorry, a day and visit, uh, you know, Towson and University of Maryland, et cetera. Well, I found out that my girls, uh, this other girl I kind of adopted as my daughter, I called my, the, my girls were not, uh, were not invited on this trip or for somehow excluded from these trips. And I, I, I wanted to, what, what, what was going on here? Because they were actually one of the two brightest kids in the school. Uh, so I say that for two reasons. One, that I think no matter who you are, especially if you're an African-American parent in this county, that you have to let it be known that you are going to be an advocate and an interventionist for your child. And that doesn't mean going to the school yelling and screaming, that you're going to be there for your child and you know uh, the, the, that, uh, that the policies and those kind of things should be administered fairly and that what's good for the goose is good for the gander and that you're not going to allow uh, blatant uh, exclusion to happen to your child in any activity. So I had to go over, I had a meeting with the principal and I said, why was my, why was my girls here excluded from these trips? Uh, I got an explanation that I didn't truly accept and I said, well, I think something needs to be done and they did plan special visits which they actually, my daughter and this other girl were taken to visit St. Mary's College and a couple other colleges within the state. So you have to be willing to advocate and take stands and, and not, as I say, back up to the pay table when it comes to your children. Because I uh, like, like any other organization, the squeaky wheel kind of gets the oil. If they think that they can um, do what they want to do um, and they won't get any pushback or repercussions that, that that'll do it because they're just like any other system. Uh, you know, they basically have no conscience. <laughs> <laughs> um, jumping back to you and your wife, do you feel like either of you had any like negative experiences in the community or in the workplace or anything being an interracial couple? Uh, you know, all that all that happened a little bit before we got here in other in other locations. Uh, I have to say, within the, well, let me back up. Let me back up there. There were there were a couple of incidents with my wife, and uh, and I think it was because she was a stay-at-home mother during that, during those period of time when we were here in Maryland. Uh, there were instances, and we lived in a primarily white neighborhood. Uh, here's a whole other situation. I have to bring another situation to mind about housing. Uh, when we bought our house, we live in a, uh, I'll get to the other story in a minute. We get to, when we bought our house in uh, the neighborhood we live in, I found out we bought our house from another black couple. There were two or three other 
black families within the community that we lived in. And, um, and this was a middle class neighborhood. And I ultimately found out that the house is turned over by race, which was a, blew me away. In other words, I bought another black family's house, and the other two black families, they bought black families' houses. And uh, I, 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 I thought, it, at first, actually, I thought it was an accident. I thought it was just maybe circumstance and accident. Then I went to try and sell my house after my divorce. And the real estate agent came up to me and she said, Mr. Primfield, I hope you don't take offense to this, but you have a very nice home here. It'll sell quicker if you take all references that this is a black family off the wall. In other words, take the pictures off the wall of my family, kids, and everything, or any photos that might uh, hint that a black family lives here. So immediately I said, okay, no thanks. I think I'll just keep the house. <laughs> But that, yeah, that, 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 was, that was one incident that I found very, very strange. Uh, the other incident with my wife was, I, uh, and I think it was because she was a stay-at-home mother and, and I operated in another sphere because I was out working in a professional venue, so to speak. But she befriended some of the other housewives uh, or mothers in the community. And they would have lunch and do things together, activities with the kids, they were all mothers and that kind of thing. And this one lady uh, that she befriended, uh, she was going to lunch with her one day. And I came home and my, and she was, my wife was just steamed. And I said, well, what's the matter? She said, did you realize that the, that, uh, that the lady will remain unnamed across the street? We went to lunch today. And in the car on the way to lunch, she told me that in our conversations today, she was introducing me to some more lady friends that I hadn't met before. She said, in the car on the way, when you, when you get to lunch today, just don't mention about anything that your husband being black. And, uh, <laughs> and she said, if we weren't so far, I would have turned around and tell her to just take me back home. But yeah, that, that was, I remember, that sticks out in my mind that uh, that, that, was, that that did happen to her while we were here. So. Uh. Well, uh, do you have any uh, outstanding memories as far as like one major positive, one major mem negative memory of from living in this area since you've been here? Um, the major negative, I don't really have a, I guess a, a major negative, because uh, you know there haven't been any crosses burned on my lawn, and everything. I mean, the, the 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 again the prejudice or the racism. It was probably more uh, what you would call systemic uh, than than overt, so to speak. Uh, but the positive thing, I, I suppose, is that my girls ultimately got a great education here. Uh, they developed very well. I, I really admire the people that they have turned out to be, the adults that they've turned out to be. They got great educations. They had good that that prepared them well for college. Um, and I guess the, the 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 positive thing was that they, in spite of all that we have been through as a family over the years, and not just that's not just here in Maryland, that we have overcome that and turned out to be what I would call a good, well-adjusted family. And I think ultimately. Uh, if you want to look at something called revenge. Uh, or, 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 and I hate to use the, even use the term revenge, but, but uh, having the satisfaction of living well and doing right and being happy and well adjusted in the community is the best testimony to that is living well and being successful. Because it's, I believe that there's nothing more than and the enemy, if you want to describe whoever the enemy might be. And the enemy likes better is to see you uh, frustrated, uh, to see you fail, to see you flustered and, uh, uh, and, and, and reacting in an unseemly way. And then they feel they can say, I told you so. You know, they can always go back and say, I told you I didn't, you couldn't trust them. I told you that they would always behave this way when they got into a pinch. I told you that they would, you know, whatever the next line is. But when you live well, uh, 
when your kids are well adjusted, when you walk around with a smile on your face and you're happy and content with your life, I think it drives them nuts. <laughs> it drives them nuts. And one other thing I have to admit, uh, well, I met uh, two or three people here that were very influential in my life that are truly had been a blessing. And those two people were Walt Michael and Ira Zepp. Uh, and through my relationships with Walt Michael and Ira Zepp, uh, we found it common ground on the hill. And uh, that has been one of my, oh, proudest achievements that I've ever been involved with in my life. Because we were basically a bunch of old hippies from the 60s who were, we came from the generation where we were sitting in and protesting and marching and being hosed and all those kind of things and uh, you know the King assassination, the Kennedys assassinations. We came from that era, but then ultimately we all had to get jobs and take care of our families. You know, like a lot of people, we all had to go to work, take care of our families. So, you know, to us that was like uh, we were selling out, so to speak. But we had to eat. We had family, got kids. So, but. I think there was always that longing and that lingering in our hearts about what can we do to change the injustices, what can we do to fight for social justice, what can we do to change just our little sphere of the world. And Walt was the impetus. He came up with this idea of common ground on the hill by uh, changing people's attitudes and breaking down barriers through the arts. Uh, through that seed with Ira, myself, a fellow named Bill Troxler, and some other people who I, I, I can't come to mind now, the seed for Common Ground on the Hill was planted 16 years ago. Uh, we started out with a little black gospel choir that we used people from the community. Uh, we started out applying for grants. Uh, we started out using a, a lot of Ira, uh, Ira Zepp's uh, influence in terms of getting support and, and, and um, uh, a push to get us started. Uh, a lot of uh, influential McDaniel College alumni, uh, especially in the form of David Carrasco and Victor McTeer, who you maybe have heard of. Uh, Victor McTeer is one, I think, won his first civil rights, I mean, his first Supreme Court justice case at 28 years old. Wonderful, wonderful man. Lives in Meridian, Mississippi, I believe. Um, so through people like him and the people I've uh, aforementioned, uh, the seed was planted for common ground, and we have been successful. I think we became actually in, our, in the black in our fourth or fifth year, and we've been on a roll ever since. We've even started an overseas uh, branch called Common Ground Scotland. Uh, we have an average of four to 500 participants every year for our uh, uh, Traditions Week in the early July. Uh, we have artists and teachers from all over the world in the United States participating in our program. Uh, we are, have been acclaimed uh, as one of the foremost uh, artistic organizations in the country, along with Chick, uh, Chuck, uh, uh, what's this, Chick, uh, upstate New York, Jamestown, New York, Chautauqua, yes, Chautauqua Arts uh, Organization and Sewanee in North Carolina, which are two of the three uh, top artistic organizations in the country. And um, we're just very proud, proud of that, very, very, very proud of that. Um, do you want to get into any uh, the specifics of the Common Ground Hill at McDaniel College and what you've accomplished there and your role in that department? Oh, we've accomplished so much. Um, we have uh, started the American Music Festival, uh, which we sandwich between our Traditions Week every summer. Uh, and that, that's being, that's held at the Farm Museum. Uh, that American Music Festival has grown in its, in its attendance and in its uh, popularity each year that we have had it. Uh, we have started the, what we call the Ira Zepp Peace and Justice Institute, uh, that, which is primarily managed by two wonderful people, pa uh, Pam Zapardino and Charles Collier. Uh, they conduct civil rights tours, they do diversity training, uh, they do peace and justice uh, uh, classic classwork at the university and at other universities and other venues. Uh, they advocate for the underdog, um, for the marginalized, for the disenfranchised. Uh, they 
let it be known that the, all the privileges and the benefits that we have today as people of color and marginalized people and disenfranchised people, Mexican-American, African-American, what have you, didn't just happen overnight. There is a, uh, there was a body of work that happened in the 50s and in the 60s that preceded the privileges and what have you that we have today that people died for, that people suffered for, and to understand the dynamics of all that history and how it plays on uh, the opportunities that young men like you have today. So uh, we, uh, from the artistic point of view, uh, we have several recording uh, artists and people who have come to join us and, and, and uh, in the form of Leah Gilmore. There's an artist, Leah Gilmore, who's a world-renowned gospel singer traveling in Europe today, who served on our board, who is a, an a advocate and a supporter of what we do. She doesn't serve on the board at present, but she takes her common ground learning and teaching and advocacy wherever she goes, wherever she sings, wherever she performs. Uh, she takes that attitude with her and the teaching with her and that being in that presence uh, with her. Um, we, uh, we're just very, very proud. We have a, 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 a worldwide, if you will, standing in the artistic world and in the, uh, in the social justice world. Well, I'd like to thank you again, Mr. Brumfield, for talking to us today and sharing your memory with us. If, uh, before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to say finally? Well, I'm just honored that uh, young men like you, Larry, and, uh, and Miguel over there behind the camera are, are doing things like this. I think it's just so wonderful that you all have uh, decided to connect and understand the history behind uh, not only where you are going to school now, but just the whole history and the, uh, the cycle that has allowed you to do some of the things you're doing now and that you can carry it forward and do it for the next generation and your children and the children that follow. So I think this is just a wonderful uh, program, a wonderful uh, opportunity, and I'm just honored to participate. I thank you for allowing me. So can you tell us, Mr. Brumfield, uh, a little more about your professional career? Yeah. Um, yeah, I ended up uh, going to Purdue University it's on a football scholarship. Uh, I ended up playing football there for three years. Uh, I was injured in the fourth year. And uh, at one time, like a lot of people, thinking about going on pro onto a professional career, uh, sports medicine wasn't in the 60s what it is today, uh, tore my Achilles tendon and uh, concentrated on my studies. There's two reasons for that. One, I was starting my family, and two, uh, uh, people with short memories don't realize that football players in the 60s and 70s did not earn anywhere near the money that they earn today. In fact, if you were not a star football player, and I don't know if you have, weren't a Jim Brown, if you've heard of Jim Brown, I'm sure, or, uh, a Bart Starr, who is, if you weren't one of those people, you had to have a second job in the off season. That's the kind of money that they were paid. So um, I, I was very fortunate in that I was not only born with uh, athletic skill, I was born with a brain. So I, I, I completed my studies in uh, chemical engineering and uh, had a, a mentor down there who said, there's no sense in you going out now. Uh, you're, I was actually limping on crutches because of my Achilles tendon was torn. And he said, I have a graduate program. It's a bridge program that I'm starting for African-American kids who come to Purdue who may not be up to snuff in the math and the English and those kind of things. They come in the summer, and we need uh, graduate students to help them along to get them up to speed so that when September starts, they can um, start the regular programming. So I started that program. And that afforded me a graduate degree uh, in, in the business program called the Business Opportunity Program, which gave me an MBA. So I got my engineering degree and I'm an MBA. This was 1970. Now, my dad told me, as long as I, my dad, who was a product of the South, obviously Mississippi, Alabama, you know, the lynching years, he said, boy, you know that those white people are not going to let you work in their corporation. You better get a teaching certificate. <laughs> Cause he, and, that's, and he was operating from his experience. Okay, I mean, I wasn't down playing or making fun of him, but from his experience, 
black people could only be teachers and social workers back in the 70s at least. And um, so obviously, you know, back in those days, you do what dad says. So what I did was, if, through all of that, even though I didn't teach, I got a teaching certificate in the state of Indiana. Went to work for a corporation anyway and stayed with the corporation for 30 years in various corporations. I went to work for, uh, uh, my first corporation was Coining Glass and then Bausch and Lomb. Then I ended up staying in the chemical industry for the next 30 years. I worked my way up to uh, middle management right below the vice presidential level. It was called a director's level. And I was promoted here to Maryland as the director of business for the Mid-Atlantic which means I was responsible for all of their business from Philadelphia to, uh, uh, to, to uh, Southern Virginia, to like Richmond, Virginia. And um, it afforded me worldwide travel. It afforded me things that I had never thought that I would do in, in my life. Uh, I would get on a plane on Monday and I would fly halfway across the United States uh, to Europe or whatever and come back on Friday. Uh, I was negotiating multi-million dollar contracts with people. Uh, uh, it was just uh, an existence that I never dreamed could happen to a person who came out of my circumstances. Uh, ultimately, I did retire. There were, there were ups and downs in that career, too. I mean, there's always ups and downs. But again, from my, my, my attitude and my background, and this is one of the things I think sports does for people. It's not necessarily whether you can go to the NBA or whether you can go uh, to the NFL or whatever. Sports allows you to pick yourself up when you fall down. It gives you that attitude that I can do whatever I choose to do and you're not going to stop me, that if I get stopped for three yards here, the next time I'm going to run for the touchdown. And I think you might understand that. Um, so with that attitude going into life, in the corporate life will surely do that to you if, if there's any way that they can deter you especially in this time now because I was an aberration and I knew that I was eye candy in 1970 you know the only reason they did it because it was you know the civil rights era there was there was publicity there was you know uh, it was I was it was an advantage to them to have a black person who could speak the king's English in up front <laughs> but ultimately Ultimately, people will act in their best interest. It's one of the things I found out. Ultimately, people act in, once they find out that you can do certain things that they can't do, or that you can do certain things that they're not willing to do, or that you're willing to work as hard as they are to get uh, to the same place they want, they will say, well, you know, if he looks good, I look good. So then they add value to your presence and the whole attitude changes. You stop being a token and you start being a valuable member of the community, of the team. And not necessarily, again, because they love you, but it's because of what you can do for them. You know? so, but that, that's, that's, that's American corporate values, so, and, and you have to understand that. So I, 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 I jumped in. I had to put three kids to school. I wanted to live a decent life, so I did what I had to do. Uh, uh, from my vantage point, it was fairly successful. In fact, I got to be a member of the, of the old boys team to a point. And this is what this is what they do for each other. You might want to edit this out. <laughs> when I got my when I was going through my divorce, you see what they do for each other. When when guys at the executive level get divorces, they come to you and say, "Is it rough? Uh, can we do anything for you? Do you need a job transfer? Do you need to get away from?" A to go to B to get away from quote the ex-wife, so this is what those are the kind of things that go on that they'll do for each other. And they actually came to me and asked me, uh, "Do you, you know? Do you want those? You want me us to do that for you? You know, we can. I was I was here in Maryland. Do you want we could we have a job for you at the corporate office if you want? We can move you to Connecticut. The corporate office. We can move you to Connecticut. We can give you this job. You can stay in this job for two or three years, and you can." Uh, uh. I said, "You know." Uh, I'm raising my children. First and foremost, I'm a father. And I, I had to really get in touch with my value system because that was, it was a career path to being a vice president. And, uh, and I said, you know, I, I'm raising my children. First and foremost, I'm a father. I'm not going to uproot them and move them to Connecticut and actually take them away from their mother because the mother was still, even though she wasn't with me, she was still active in their lives. Uh, so I'm just going to you know, I'll bide my time here, continue to do my job, because I, I owe it to them to give them some stability. So I did 
stay here and kind of and that basically put a cap on my career. But that was okay. I was okay with that. I knew that that when I, by saying no in in those eras when you say no, you kind of end your career. <laughs> but uh, but again, my daughters are more important. So I, I stayed here and I retired. Uh, I was again blessed to retire at an early age, and. Um, I had a lot of other things uh, that were on my mind. I've always been active in the church. Um, I always had a hobby of, of being a, of somewhat of a vocalist myself. Again, not that I'm going to quit my day job, but I, my mother was a church pianist, and I always sang a little bit. And uh, so I've always done a little bit of that, been, a, been uh, a speaker, public speaking, and those kind of things. Talked to some people that I admire in the church and who were very close friends of mine, and they said, you know, you— the ministry may be one of your callings. So at that point, uh, uh, through some careful thought and prayer, I ended up going to seminary and, uh, and within the Brethren Church, which is a, 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 a mainline Protestant, Protestant denomination. Um, and actually, I'm still going in, into seminary, but while in the Brethren Church, while you're going to seminary, you can be licensed as a minister. So I am a licensed minister in the Brethren Church. Also decided to do some substitute teaching uh, in the public schools. Uh, that's where my father's wisdom play, paid off. If you remember, I told you that he insisted that I get this teaching certificate. Well, Carroll County School System honored that as a degree teacher. On it, uh, my, my status as a degree teacher which meant that I could go substitute teach at kind of like full, at the full rate, so to speak. Uh, uh, so I, I started the sub program. And, uh, and I have been substituting for the last four or five years within the system. Uh, at one time, actually, I was hired as the site building sub at South Carroll High, which means I was the permanent sub there. I went to school, went there every day and, uh, and, and took an assignment with, that, that was available to me. I found out that that was a bit much. Uh, I found out that time had uh, <laughs> war had passed on and the value system that I had as a young man had completely been extinguished and uh, gone, you know, by the wayside. And the kids in the high school today were not what they were when I was in high school. Not that we were angels, don't get me wrong, not we were angels, but there was just a certain level of respect that we had that uh, we did our dirt away from the adults. They do their dirt in front of the adults. And, uh, you know, the, the cursing up and down the hall, the calling each other names, the public displays of affection, we did all of that, but we just didn't do it in front of the adults. <laughs> and they don't, they don't seem to care. And I just couldn't take the disrespect that they, uh, they, they uh, had for teachers uh, and each other uh, was just repugnant to me. And um, after that, I decided that I just couldn't do it full time. I would do it on call. And they have a very good call system that you, they'll call you uh, and say, you know, we have certain jobs open and you can say yes or no. So that's the way I operate now. And on that basis, I take two or three jobs a, a week, you know, to, to keep busy. But yes, the, the getting back there, the, we have a long way to go in the Carroll County school system with respect to, uh, to, to race, acceptance. Um, um, uh, the, there, there is a population of gay and lesbian students in this county that are being bullied and harassed just because of who they are. Uh, there are African-American kids in the, in the classrooms who are operating with a different different set of standards uh, in terms of how many opportunities and chances you get before you are expelled or suspended or go to the school principal and those kind of things. And what I found most repugnant, because I do have uh, two grandchildren in the, in the system now, and I have a six-year-old grandson, a little, you know, in an elementary school here in this county. And what I'm finding out is that there is such a cultural void between who they hire to teach and th and the kids they're teaching that they just don't understand how black kids or African American kids or generally I believe kids of color behave from a social interaction point of view. For instance, um, uh, my 12 year old grandson who goes to a middle school here, they can play basketball on the basketball court. And they'll be, sh they'll shoot a basket, and then they'll high five each other, and, and they'll say, you know, in your face, and the things that we do on the playground that we find normal behavior. Uh, the the uh, 
what do they call it, uh, uh, congratulating, uh, congratulating and, and, and celebrating, you know, when they do something good. It's perceived as bad behavior. And, uh, and, and, it, and it should not be. You know, that's just a cultural difference. You know, just because a, a, a black kid high fives and chest bumps after they do something good does not mean that they're bad. And, they, and, and in some instances, they were being actually punished for this. And uh, fortunately, there were some uh, progressive people in, in, in the classroom that actually called me and told me that this was going on. Uh, one of the school counselors called me and she, she called, a, she asked me if I could get a bunch of black fathers and, uh, to come and have a sit down in her school with her, with her principal and a couple of the teachers and explain to them that this isn't uh, repugnant behavior, this is a negative behavior, this is a cultural uh, difference that, should, that they should be aware of as teachers if they're gonna teach a multicultural classroom. Uh, and now that, uh, fortunately, we were able to communicate that to these teachers. Now, this is only one school now, so I'm sure it's happening in other schools, but we communicated that to those teachers. We have a relationship. We meet with them on a quarterly basis to see how things are going, to see if we can do anything to assist, to see if there's a need to have uh, one of our presence there, like in a gym class, or, or if we can be in, in, in an advisory role of some kind. And, uh, and, but that was, I have to admit, that was because of the awareness of one of the school counselors who serves on this committee called the um, uh, ETM. Um, what's that called? The Educational Multicultural Committee that, uh, that, that's operating here in the county. So those kind of things are, uh, uh, that are very satisfying. Also, in the East Middle School, which, which uh, serves the primarily uh, underclass and people and children of color in this community, the, the, which is the middle school that served that population. Um, <clears throat> when I sub there, I find, and, it, and, and, and I'm both kind of pleased and concerned. Uh, when I go walk into that school, and I've been there several times, though, but when I walk into that school, I, uh, I, I don't, I'm not there, I'm there maybe once every 60 days or so. But when I walk into that school, I'm, I'm, I'm immediately mobbed. I mean, surrounded like I'm a celebrity by the black kids because they don't see black men in the school system in that role. They don't see people like me in their lives who are doing something positive or just there that they can be proud of. Uh, these kids will run around, and of course, they'll embellish. They'll run around and say, oh, they call me Mr. B. They, they'll, kids, they'll run around and say, oh, Mr. B is my cousin. Mr. B is my this. And, and I'm, I'm really not, but you know, they'll say that. And because they, are, they, they have such a need to have somebody positive uh, in their lives doing something that befriends them, uh, that has a positive influence, role influence in their lives. Now, I'm glad to serve in that role, don't get me wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm pained that I may be one of the only ones serving in that role. I wish that there was just so many more to, uh, around to be able to do that, um, which tells me that there's just uh, an emotional vacuum there that needs to be filled. Um, and, uh, and, and I guess I might throw out that that'll be, that those, those are kind of roles that young men like you and Miguel and other men at the college maybe can be able to can, can participate in and do. Uh, there may be things that you can, they have a wonderful principal at East Middle uh, who, who loves innovative programming and uh, he would love to talk to people, you know, like you and other people who may be able to be mentors and to some of these uh, young kids. Uh, some of them come from very, very devastating environments, you know, where, you know, they eat breakfast uh, at school because there's no food in the morning. Uh, 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 there's no supervision when they go home. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they, they're sleeping three and four in a bed, that kind of stuff. So uh, sometimes a mother is selling the food stamps for drugs. And, you know, that's the reality of those, ki of those kids' lives. So, you know, but there is hope. You know, uh, a child has so much hope and enthusiasm when when you allow them to connect with somebody who's who shows genuine interest and care in caring for them and and I think just when you're allowed to do that you, you never know how you connect with people that the fact that I 
can put my arm around a little boy or something or just talk to him a few minutes or a young girl and show some interest in them, you never know that that might overcome some bad experience that they had the night before with somebody who was in, intoxicated or high on drugs or, or abusive to them or whatever. So you never know when you're doing something to counterbalance some horrible uh, activity that has happened in their lives. So I'm very thankful and blessed that I have had a life uh, that I could take some time in my life now to give back and do something like that. I wish I could do more. Obviously, I'm only one person, but I I, uh, I take pride and I take pride in doing doing that and helping these young people out wherever I can.